Good morning, everyone. As usual, we still have a little but a little bit of a uh, delay as people are finishing up joining here. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started and they can catch up. Um, we're going to start by doing a little bit of review and then we're going to be doing um, the rest of our of this chapter is dealing with a class of reactions called electrophilic substitution. So most of the substitution we've been doing to this point has been nucleophilic substitution. Um, and then we've seen electrophilic addition reactions with alkenes and dienes. But we haven't seen electrophilic substitution yet. And so that, that really comes into play when we're talking about um, benzene rings. The benzene rings being so stable is what allows us to do electrophilic substitution instead of just breaking pi bonds. All right, so let's work on, or uh, let's uh, go over, I believe these were some of the quiz questions, right? Um, and so one was not explicitly from chapter 17, but we have this first reaction of NBS and followed by TBOK. What is going to be our product after step one here? What is what type of reaction is NBS? It's the free radical bromination thing. Free radical bromination, right? So we're going to pull off a hydrogen and replace it with a bromine. And where does it preferentially going to brominate? I think it's going to go on the, uh, yeah. Right, that benzylic position, because it allows us to, um, it's, it's stabilized by resonance. So after step one, We're going to wind up with this plus EN and we do have to worry about plus EN because we, we want, made it a new stereo center by replacing a hydrogen and um, with bromine now we have four different substituents attached to that carbon um, it's not going to really matter, though, because what happens in step two? TBU OK favors the strong base that favors. Is that the Hoffman product with the terminal alkene? Yeah, we're going to make the Hoffman product, not the Zaitsev product, but in this case, um, there's only really one option. So any strong base is going to wind up giving you the same, the same product in this case, because we can't put a um, double bond directly attached to the benzene ring, because then we'd have a carbon with five bonds. So any strong base would give us the same thing here. We wind up making styrene. And so all you needed to show for the for the quiz was the styrene product at the end. And then if we're looking at, I'm going to clear these um, annotations here so that we can spend some time or some have some space for our next step. All right. So if we're trying to draw the mechanism in the product, and we've got this is just like that dissolving metal reaction, right? Sodium metal in a, in liquid ammonia 
with a proton source. This is that birch reduction. We're going to break a benzene ring up and we're going to wind up putting two sp3 carbons in the middle of that chain and they're going to be opposite of each other. And in this case, we have four different electron donating substituents attached to the benzene ring. And so if we draw the first step here. Yeah. Our first step is going to look like anytime you have sodium, your first step is always almost always going to be donating an electron from the sodium to whatever you have around. Benzene doesn't really want to accept an extra electron, but it's the sodium is such a good reducing agent, it basically forces the benzene to take that extra electron. So you wind up putting it on either the top or the bottom carbon, because remember that top and the bottom carbon um, are not going to be covered up. We have all these electron donating methyl groups. And so you're not going to force that extra electron to go anywhere where you've already got an electron donating group attached to the benzene ring. So your, your extra electron goes on either the top or the bottom carbon. And then we wind up with kind of an odd chain reaction of single electrons moving around to give us an intermediate that looks like habit. It's going to look like this. We have a lone pair with a negative charge at the top. And now we have a free radical at the bottom. And so the, the next step is once you have that negative charge on the benzene ring, when you expose it, if it's exposed to um, methanol at the same time, methanol is just going to act as a proton source. Um, we have to use methanol or an alcohol as a proton source because water is going to react too strongly with the sodium metal. Um, and so we wind up needing to use a, a weaker acid than water. Um, so methanol, ethanol, TBOK even, um, but it can't be water as your proton source in this case. But it's going to look pretty similar to what we would um, what we would expect from any proton transfer. And I'm going to try and make use of all my space here. So we still have that free radical at the bottom, but we added our new hydrogen at the top. And the last step is going to be another proton or another electron donation from the sodium. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we have a lone pair at the bottom instead of a free radical. And then we do another proton transfer step. So our final product.
going to look like that. We wind up making two sodium ions and two methoxy ions. Um, over the course of this, those are byproducts. The main product is just turning that benzene ring into this isolated diene. And really the trickiest part about this is just where does the first is the, the first step really is the trickiest part of drawing this mechanism because you have to know where the sodium is going to put its extra electron at the beginning. And then you have to be able to draw the arrows that are going to result in your two sp3 carbons um, going into the right spots. From that, once you get to your first intermediate, once you get here, the rest of it is all stuff we were pretty familiar with at this point. Proton transfer, a little, not, the sodium donating an extra electron is, is a little bit weird because we don't deal with free radicals that often. Um, but aside from that, um, we're, we're in good shape and there's not really any, any place where you could get to the wrong, and no obvious steps where you could get to the wrong final product once you start the reaction in the right spot. Uh, any other questions on the quiz? Okay. Let's go ahead and clear that then and move. Let's talk about some spectroscopy. All right, so remember that what we're really looking at here with the spectroscopy is this was from the chapter specifically on um, aromatics. And we can definitely see really obvious signs of having a benzene ring in here. And the, um, and the integration is fairly helpful too in this case, right? Having an integration of five on a big mess of peaks somewhere between six and a half and eight and a half, the dead giveaway, not only do we have a benzene ring, but it's only substituted in one place. So if we just go through and look at the most, the most obvious conclusions from, from the, all of these um, spectra, We've definitely got a benzene ring substituted in one place. If we look at the IR, we've definitely got an OH group. And if we draw a line straight up, we can see we've got um, peaks on both sides of 3,000 marks. We have some sp3 carbons and some sp2 carbons. The sp2 carbons are no surprise because we we have a benzene ring, so we're going to definitely have some sp2 carbon hydrogens. And then we have a carbonyl peak as well. And so those are the, the first three things to look for on an IR are always do we have an alcohol? Do we have what kinds of carbon hydrogen bonds do we have? And is there something right around 1700 um, that might be a carbonyl? So down in the bottom, if I'm keeping track of what we have, we definitely have a benzene ring. We definitely have a carbonyl. We definitely have an OH. And then if we start looking at some of the more subtle things, we've got this 
peak down here right at around 2700. That's pretty sharp. And we also have this peak way up here around 10 on the proton NMR. So we know that all of our alkyl groups on a proton NMR are going to show up in about the same place. We can make some conclusions and we'll look at splitting and everything in a few minutes. But anytime something shows up way downfield, there's that's probably going to be a dead giveaway for something because we don't see that that often. Uh, and so if we look at both of those. Let me actually switch colors here. Both of those blue circles are indications that we have an aldehyde. The aldehyde carbon hydrogen bond shows up in that 27 region. Remember, I don't expect you to have that memorized off the top of your head, but if you're looking at your table of IR frequencies, um, that's one of the CH bonds that shows up in a different spot, not just right around 3000. Um, alkynes show up up high near where an alcohol would show up. Aldehydes show up a little bit lower. So not only do we have a carbonyl, it's an aldehyde. So we have an aldehyde, an alcohol, a singly substituted benzene ring, and a couple of other carbon hydrogens. So without even touching the carbon anymore, that kind of gives us a spot where we might we might be able to put together a rough idea of what we're looking at here. Aldehyde has to be on the end, and it can't be directly attached to the benzene ring because we have nine carbons, but only one thing attached to the benzene ring. So we have a chain of some sort attached to the benzene ring. And then we have an OH group somewhere, so we could put it here or here. And I believe either of those, uh, we only have one oxygen, so we can't have an OH group and an aldehyde. So we got to decide what we have better evidence for. So let's double check our proton NMR and see what this peak right around 10 is. It's possible that that's an alcohol, although usually alcohols show up down here. So it's the other option is that this thing we first circled as an alcohol might not be strong enough. Maybe that's intermolecular forces between something else. And actually, the formula tells us the answer here, right? We can't, it can't be an alcohol because then our formula would be wrong. We need two CH2s attached here. If it was an alcohol, not an aldehyde, we'd have an X, we have a CH3 at the end instead of a CH instead of just an aldehyde, and that would throw off our formula, we'd have a different degree of unsaturation. So that thing, that peak that we thought was an alcohol could be intermolecular forces between the aldehyde and, and more molecules of the aldehyde, or it could, it could just be a, um, not a byproduct, what's the word I'm looking for? Impurity. It's possible that this molecule is going is degrading, is oxidizing in the presence of water. 
or oxygen and turning into something that has an alcohol. But if we If we remove those two potential alcohols, I believe that fits our formula. We've got five hydrogens on the benzene ring, two, two, and one. So that gives us a total of another five hydrogens that matches the formula C9H10O. And then if we look at the, if we have this all right, we're not sure if we have this right or not. I'm, this is a pretty good, this matches everything from the first two spectra, but the carbon NMR could be the final tipping point because the, the carbon NMR will, if every peak in the carbon NMR matches up with a carbon, if we can assign a peak to each of the carbons on our proposed structure, then we probably did it right. So just because you have all three spectra doesn't mean you have to use all three spectra right away. You can wait and use the carbon NMR as sort of a tiebreaker. If you wind up coming up with a structure that does that makes sense for the first two, but then the carbon NMR totally contradicts it, and that means that you must have done something wrong. So in this case, with the carbon NMR, those peaks right there are going to be our benzene ring. We're gonna have four unique carbons in our benzene rings. We'll have one, two, three, and four. So those four peaks listed there are gonna be the benzene rings the carbons in the benzene ring. The most de-shielded peak that we wouldn't have even noticed if they hadn't labeled it for us is going to be our aldehyde. And these two peaks down here are going to be our alkyl carbons. So we call one, two, three, and four are our, our benzene rings, our carbons on the benzene ring. Here's carbon five and six and seven. All right, so we're going to wind up with it matching up pretty well with the structure we drew from the proton NMR and the carbon IR. So this was, was meant to be a practice on, on identifying when we have phenyl groups in there, um, but it's also a good practical lab example of sometimes we can get conflicting information that peak that looked a lot like an OH group probably is an OH group. It could be water in the sample. It could be oxidation happening. But you, the fact that usually we're used to our alcohols being that rounded shape, but also being really, really strong peaks, right? Really, really deep going you know, all the way to the bottom here or at least most of the way to the bottom. The fact that it didn't there is probably that we don't have very much of whatever is giving that peak. So our first thought when we're looking at it should be, oh, that's an alcohol, just like we did. But then we wind up with, with two conflicting structures, one that was an aldehyde and one that was the alcohol, and we had to decide. But we had every piece 
of evidence that shows up for an aldehyde showed up. Um, especially when we look at the proton NMR and the carbon NMR, those peaks way at the way downfield, all the way to the left. Those are dead giveaways. You don't see that for an alcohol. So our IR had conflicting information, but our NMRs basically removed that conflicting piece of information for us. Um, and I would not ask you one that tricky on a timed test um, because that is one that takes a little bit of practice to be able to recognize, oh, oh, I know what's happening here. That's not one that you guys have that much experience with yet. Yet. You'll get there if you keep studying chemistry. All right, questions on the spectra one. So one other piece of information that makes it clear that we it has to be the aldehyde and not the alcohol is the fact that our integration down on the proton NMR, we have two CH2s. If you had an alcohol attached somewhere, you wouldn't have two CH2s. If it was the primary alcohol, If you had the OH attached at the end, you would have three CH2s. And if you had the alcohol attached somewhere in the middle, you'd have a CH2, a CH, and the CH3. So the fact that we only had two alkyl peaks down at the bottom and they were both CH2s further confirms that now, despite what the IR looks like, we can't have an alcohol. There's no possible way we could write this um, with an alcohol that would match up with the rest of our information. Um, I Trying to remember, it might be from uh, from Sherlock Holmes, um, that uh, that saying, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever's left must be must be true. And so we thought there might be an alcohol there, but then we have five pieces of evidence saying no, it absolutely can't be an alcohol. So despite that really obvious looking alcohol-ish peak in the IR, it can't be an alcohol. So that must be something else giving that peak, despite the fact that that seems unlikely that we would have conflicting reports here. It has to be the case because there's no other way we could explain everything else that's happening. All right, let's talk about benzene some more. Everybody likes talking about resonance, right? And that's everybody's favorite subject by now. Everybody is um, you know, boring the heck out of your roommates and family by talking about benzene ring and resonance nonstop all the time. Um, we know at this point that we don't see the same classes of reactions with benzene, right? Normal, if we had a, a, an alkene or a diene, um, we can go through addition reactions, all sorts of different addition reactions. And those are those electrophilic addition reactions where we have something that's attracted to the pi electrons. And we're going to wind up breaking pi bond and adding things. We don't see that with benzene, though, because if we did that, we would lose that aromatic character. We would lose those molecular orbitals that make it so stable. So we don't see electrophilic addition with benzene. What we see with benzene is we can force it to, br to break that benzene ring by going through that Birch reduction we talked about. 
we can use that benzene ring to add things in the benzylic position, but we can't do anything that's gonna break that benzene ring just like an addition reaction. But we do have a whole nother class of reactions where instead of breaking pi bonds, we wind up substituting something for one of the existing hydrogens. Right? And so this is that, and that substitution reaction I was talking about at the beginning of the class, it's electrophilic substitution. And a lot of times um, you'll see them write the word aromatic in there. This really electrophilic substitution really only happens when you've got an aromatic molecule. Um, so it's a little bit redundant to say that. Um, and so but we're, the difference here is that we're not breaking a pi bond though. We're gonna we're gonna rip a hydrogen off and replace it with a bromine, but we still wind up with just as many pi bonds before and after. So we still keep that aromatic character. This is a little bit weird though, because so just having bromine does nothing. But if we have bromine and iron or other metals, we can get this reaction to happen with reasonable yields, not, not great yields. So what could the metal be doing that might make this change? Uh, accepting some of the electron density? Accepting Anything electron else? density. So if it accepts electron density, that makes it a Lewis acid. Um, we're going, if it accepts electron density from the bromine, that's going to make one of the bromines more attracted to the electrons in the aromatic structure. And we can see that a variety of reactions that are similar here. Um, you can replace a hydrogen on a benzene ring with a bromine, with a chlorine, with a nitro group, with a sulfur group. Um, we can even do it with an alkyl group or a, a ketone. So we have a, a whole range of ways we can now add functional groups to benzene rings. Um, and so this winds up being a really important class of reactions because this all of a sudden allows us to start from benzene and make a huge range of different compounds, right? So we haven't really done much synthesis with benzene because we can't really do much with benzene until now. All we could do with benzene was brominate in the, in the benzylic position. But now we have a way to add functional groups. Um, and it turns out that, that our mechanism is going to be somewhat similar to it when we halogenate a pi bond. So if we had bromine and an alkene group, this was our mechanism. Our bromination of, of an alkene is we started with bromine Br2. We wind up with this kind of strange step happening at the beginning um, where we wind up with one of the bromines leaving with negative charge. The other bromine makes this three-sided ring structure. Um, and then your other bromide that left at the beginning can come in and attach the other side. And we wind up adding a bromine to each side. And so if we're dealing with an alkene, this works. Bromine though is too stable. We can't break that pi bond. So we need it to be a better electrophile. And that's where the iron comes in. And just like Cody guessed that, that that iron was accepting some of the electron density. If it's accepting some electron density from the bromine, 
that's going to make the, the remaining pieces of the bromine are going to be more electrophilic. They're going to be more attracted to that pi bond, the pi bonds in the benzene ring. And so this is back in gen chem, we said there were three definitions for acids and bases, right? We said there was the Arrhenius definition was just when you add it to water, it increases the pH or decreases the pH. When you, and then we had the Bronsted-Lowry, which is what we use most of the time, both in gen chem and in OCHEM, a Bronsted-Lowry acid was whatever's gonna give up a proton. The Lewis acid definition hasn't been all that useful to us until now. A Lewis acid, instead of donating a proton, it accepts electron density. And when you have something that accepts electron density, that can, that can wind up making things more electrophilic. Whatever winds up being attached to the iron is going to now be missing electron density it usually has. And so we have a, a mechanism for this that's pretty straightforward. If you have iron, iron in the presence of bromine will usually oxidize right away into this um, iron three bromide, but then it can still accept one more pair of electrons and you wind up with this intermediate where you have bromine, what was a Br2 is now attached. And you wind up making something that's very electrophilic. You wind up making bromine with a positive charge, essentially. And that bromine with a positive charge is going to find electrons somewhere. So this is kind of similar to, it's similar but opposite to the sodium um, metal from the beginning. Sodium metal is so unstable, it's trying to force an electron onto benzene rings. Bromine is so electrophilic, it's trying to steal electrons anywhere it can. And it's enough of an electrophile that it can actually attach to a benzene ring. And so essentially what we did is we just made it so unstable, we can actually get around that, that aromatic stability. And so then what we actually wind up seeing when we, when we do that to the bromine and we make that really strong electrophile is it does wind up attaching to the benzene ring. It attaches to the benzene ring and we actually temporarily break the benzene ring's aroma, aromaticity. Um, but we still have a fairly good leaving group attached. So bromine with a positive charge is super unstable. But hydrogen with a positive charge, we see that all the time, right? And so what happens is once that bromine gets attached to the benzene ring, we have a temporary state called the sigma complex. The sigma complex is just this intermediate where we have a bunch of resonance that can still happen, um, but we we basically turned one of our carbons in the benzene ring into an sp3 carbon temporarily. And so there are lots of there are three different resonance structures we can draw for this, um, but the end result is always going to be that we kick the hydrogen off. Hydrogen's a better leaving group. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, hydrogen is a better leaving group than the bromine is. And so the hydrogen winds up leaving its electrons behind. Um, and we can remake the benzene ring. We just have pulled off the hydrogen and replaced it with the bromine or whatever our electrophile is. So anything that's a strong enough electrophile is going to go through a similar mechanism. They're all going to make that sigma complex. And you're going to have those that sp3 carbon temporarily. And then you kick the hydrogen off. And you remake the benzene ring.
there are a variety of different metals you can use. And Lewis acids are generally metals. You need something with a positive charge that's going to pull electron density away. So metal ions are really common. So iron bromide, aluminum bromide. Um, occasionally, you might even see magnesium bromide. Um, but typically, iron and aluminum are the most common metals that we see for this. And they're basically just to kick things off. You need to make that bromine a strong enough electrophile at the beginning to start this process. And so we can we can also see why we wind up with the substitution happening instead of the addition. So if we if we were trying to go and make an addition reaction, if we we're going to break a pi bond and add something to each side, like we saw with alkenes and dienes, we would still go through the same sigma complex. We'd still have an intermediate where we had this sp3 carbon um, that was one of the benzene carbons. But the fact that if we were trying to go through an addition reaction, we would wind up needing to make two. Um, sp3 carbons for starters and then we're not going to wind up making that benzene ring back again and that means that we're losing all that extra stability that we gain from being aromatic so rather than making the addition product we're never going to see that with these electrophilic reactions in benzene if we have an electro and a strong electrophile around in benzene, what's, it's going to go through this substitution process instead so that it can wind up making that benzene ring back again, again at the end. And I keep using benzene as the example because that's what we usually do. But this can be other aromatics as well. You can see this to some extent with naphthalene. You can see it with some extent with some of the, um, the heterocyclic structures with the furan where we put a... Um, and a five-sided ring with oxygen in the one of the rings and then the pi bonds on the carbons. Um, you can see some of these reactions as well, but we're gonna dive deep into benzene because benzene's the most common aromatic molecule that we see this with. Um, and we're gonna add some new wrinkles to it after we take a break in a few minutes um, that are gonna make it so we have to think about what those resonance structures actually look like as that sigma compact, that sigma complex. All right, so all that to say, this happens with other molecules. We're gonna stick to benzene though, for the sake of exploring it fully, just like with cyclohexane and the chair and the boat conformers. All right. So one more time, I'm gonna throw this slide up and then I'm gonna have you practice drawing a similar mechanism in a second. So for the bromination, the first step is we make this strong electrophile. Second step is you break a benzene ring and you make one of those carbons sp3. And then you get this sigma complex. What do you bet? The sigma complex with benzene is always going to have three resonance structures. And it's going to be the positive charge um, in the ortho position to the sp3 carbon, and then para. Right? Because that's when we break that pi bond to add the carbon bromine bond one of the adjacent carbons to where we add the bromine is going to be missing a pair of electrons. All right, so you get three different resonance structures from the sigma complex, and then you kick off that hydrogen. And you reform the benzene ring. All right, so with that in mind, Um, you guys take five minutes to draw the mechanism yourself, 
or chlorinating benzene. And then we will tie that into our break. So you can either take your break first, come back and do that, or do your mechanism now. Um, but we will resume lecture and I'll go through this mechanism at nine o'clock.
All right, how did that go? Like a lot of mechanisms, right, Elke? Um, I think I like, I think I got it. I got it, but I'm just confused on how like, um, you when we're making like the chloride ions and stuff, are you gonna go through it with us? Yep. Okay, then you'll answer my question. All right. So the first, the first step with most of these, with any Lewis acid really, is going to be that whatever you're you're going to be adding to our benzene ring is going to wind up donating electron density to the metal, and you might wind up making this weird intermediate. I didn't leave room enough to write all of the chlorines on here, but the rest of them are still on there too. But the part of this molecule that matters the most is this right here. Here, let me, sorry, stop, share. All right, so electrons donated to the metal make this weird positively charged halogen, which is still has a full valence, but it has a positive charge. And we know that's not stable for electronegative elements, right? So then what happens is we wind up with this whole situation being so starved for electrons that you steal a pair of pi electrons from the benzene ring. And then the chlorine that's directly attached to the aluminum keeps the pair of electrons in the fluorine-chlorine bond. And so that's what's going to make our sigma complex is now we've attached a chlorine to one of these two carbons. And at this point, it doesn't matter which one. But we wind up making an intermediate that's going to look like Put all the pi bonds in the same place here. All right, and so this is our sigma complex. When we've taken one of those benzene carbons and turned it into an sp3 carbon, and then we have an adjacent positive charge that can resonate all the way around the ring. So our three resonance structures would look like, and this is for practice at this point, you didn't need to draw this necessarily um, to get to the right product here. And that leaves a positive charge here in the para position. And then we can do that one more time. Make one last resonance structure. That would put the positive charge down here at the bottom. So I ran myself out of room on that. So I'm not gonna draw that last one, but I think you guys can see how that would happen, what it would look like look just like this with the positive charge down here. So then the last step here is that that sigma complex is just going to give away that hydrogen. And so we just need something that can accept the hydrogen around. So usually it's your Lewis acid. Um, so we had that, we now have an AL Cl4 floating around, where you've got a negative charge on the aluminum. So what winds up happening is one of these chlorines just winds up leaving and taking the protons. Of, so the these electrons that are on the, I'm actually going to switch the chlorine and the hydrogen here. For the sake of drawing this easily. 
these electrons move over to the positive charge. And one of those chlorides that's attached to the aluminum takes a pair of electrons with it and grabs that H plus. Why wouldn't so we use the, um, the, the chlorine ion that we made in that first step? That, so, uh, uh, that one. One of those chlorines, yeah. That it's basically what we're doing, but it just stays attached to the aluminum while we're doing the sigma complex. Okay. Because we we started with AlCl3 and then we gave an extra chloride mm -hmm. to the aluminum, so we made AlCl4 temporarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that but that basically is what that's the net result is is exactly what you're saying. Now we're taking that chloride, grabbing an H plus. And so our final product here is we wind up make, remaking the benzene ring. We lose a hydrogen and replaced it with a chlorine. So we made chlorobenzene. Um, and so let's see, I will clear space here just to draw the final product. And then the byproducts are we made HCl, and then we get that AlCl3 back. So that's what makes it a, a catalyst, right? That we make, we remake it over the course of the reaction. All right. So most of these elect, and just like with with SN1 and SN2 reactions. The mechanisms all look the same, right? Regardless of what our nucleophile was. We're gonna say that see the same thing here. It's regardless of what our electrophile looks like, it's always gonna go through the same process. Make a sigma complex, kick a hydrogen off and remake benzene. Um, and sometimes if you have a strong enough nucleophile, you don't even really need, or sorry, a strong enough electrophile, excuse me. Um, you don't even really need a Lewis acid necessarily. Sometimes just an acid catalyst is enough. Um, but here's the general case where they're just repl um, replacing the specific electrophile with just this E with a positive charge. So this E with a positive charge is just indicating that it's an electrophile. The same way that when we did um, SN1 and SN2, sometimes we used NU to signify a nucleophile. This is just E signifying an electrophile, All right? But it's nucleophilic attack, makes the sigma complex, proton transfer, and that remakes the benzene ring. So here's, Here's another example. Um, this is the sulf sulfonation. Um, sounds like it could be a hip hop group. Maybe that's just me listening to too much Tribe Called Quest and things like that. Um, if you have fuming sulfuric acid, which is a very, very specific mixture, very, very nasty mixture. You take concentrated sulfuric acid and then you bubble toxic sulfur trioxide into it. Um, it's basically a way to ramp up the amount of sulfur in concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, and so you, you frequently just see it written as a reagent, just as fuming H2SO4. Um, and that, what that does is it allows you to have enough sulfur trioxide in the solution um, that you can wind up with a very strong electrophile. And you wind up with the, the, the strong electrophile B is the sulfur. So oxygen's more electronegative than sulfur, right? And so when you, when you attach three oxygens to sulfur, the difference in size between those 
those orbitals and how electronegative the oxygen is means that you wind up with a with a strong partial positive on the sulfur like the formal charge and the structure looks okay but the fact that the oxygen is so electronegative gives you a really strong partial positive right here on the sulfur and so that sulfur is actually going to be our electrophile in this case And so sulfur trioxide winds up being attracted to the electrons. And so our sigma complex is just, you break one of those sulfur oxygen pi bonds, make the sigma complex, and then you kick a hydrogen off again. And then there's one last step at the end is over the course of this, we wound up with an oxygen with a negative charge throughout the sigma complex in that proton transfer here. So we just wind up protonating it. So we get a neutral product at the end. Um, but frankly, this, um, depending on what conditions you're under, if you're under basic conditions, um, this would be a reasonable um, final product if you're under basic conditions. However, this is in fuming sulfuric acid, so you're going to wind up protonating it. But you can see how it's the same, other than the fact that we had to make the SO3, and we didn't really make the SO3, this fuming sulfuric acid has SO3 in it, if you know that that's what fuming means. Um, and then we just wind up with this strong electrophile going through the same reaction we just did with bromine and chlorine. Um, we can do this with uh, nitrogen as well in the nitration of benzene, um, except we need to, this one actually is a little bit harder to make that strong electrophile. Um, so sulfuric acid is so strong of an acid that you can actually force nitric acid to act as a base um, and make this really, really weird thing called nitronium. So if you have nitric acid and you put it with concentrated sulfuric acid, those are both considered strong acids, but sulfuric acid is even stronger than nitric acid. So you can, you can um, protonate the nitric acid and make a really good leaving group. We made a water ion base or a, a water molecule basically, right? We know protonated alcohols are really good leaving groups. And so we wind up making this nitronium ion just by protonating nitric acid. But then once you make the nitronium ion, same thing we just did. Nitronium ion, the nitrogen is a very strong electrophile. You make a sigma complex, you kick a hydrogen off, and you get the nitrated benzene. Um, and this is actually the, the process of making TNT. TNT is trinitrotoluene. So if you start with toluene, and then you turn nitric acid into nitronium ion, and you have the right stoichiometry, you wind up adding three nitro groups to toluene, and you get trinitrotoluene. Um, and that really is the step that uh, I, let's see, in, in Fight Club, they're making nitroglycerin, not ni trinitrotoluene. But what you might notice that's similar between those two um, is the nitro groups. Nitro groups are really unstable. They tend to oxidize very, very quickly and produce lots of gas byproducts and exothermic reactions when they oxidize. Um, and so, Essentially, you should be very, very wary um, and cautious around anything with nitro groups attached to it, frankly. Nitro groups are usually pretty nasty. Um, trying to think of a case where a nitro group is not either toxic or explosive, and I'm planking. Nitroglycerin in very small amounts is a heart medication, 
but that's very, very small amounts and it's stabilized. Maybe like a antibacterial, like nitrate type stuff, silver nitrates. So nit yeah, nitrates are okay. Um, they're still, they're not that stable. They're, they will react pretty quickly too under the right conditions, but they're, they're more stable than a nitro group. If you put a nitro group on an organic compound, that's usually when you should be worried. Nitrates, you see those actually in a lot of food. You see nitrates in deli meat um, as, a, as a preservative. Pickling salt has nitrate in it. Um, but as soon as you attach it to something organic, you wind up with these these really unstable situations happening. All right. For practice sake, let's do this one more time. This is the process of generating the electrophile. Now use nitronium as your electrophile and draw the sigma complex and what your final product would look like. And I need to step away from one second. So I'm gonna turn off my camera and then we'll come back and go over it. All right, once we have our electrophile, the nitronium ion, this is a fairly straightforward mechanism again, right? So one of the pairs of pi electrons jumps over and attaches to the nitrogen. Let's make sure we don't go more than eight electrons on the nitrogen now. So you have to break one of these pi bonds here. So then our sigma complex is going to look like it's going to look like this for starters. 
and then we can resonate that charge around. So we could put the positive charge either in the in either of the two ortho positions or in the para position. But the next step as far as the mechanism goes, is going to be, we kick the hydrogen off. We need something to accept that hydrogen. So whatever is the, whatever base might be around. So the nitric acid, for instance, could be a base, we wind up making more nitronium ion because we have, Actually, if we have nitric acid floating around, we've already established that's a weaker base than the sulfuric acid, right? So when we kick the hydrogen off, it's probably that oxygen that's going to accept. either that or the, actually we deprotonated sulfuric acid at the beginning, so that might actually make more sense. If we took the hydrogen sulfate, we made we made hydrogen sulfate at the beginning, right? When we deprotonated it and we had protonated the um, nitric acid. So this probably makes more sense as our um, proton acceptor. But either of them really would work because the second we make sulfuric acid again, it's gonna go off and protonate another nitric acid. So you could skip this step too. Um, and just draw the nitric acid as the, as the base in this reaction. And then our final product winds up being Nitrobenzene, right? And if we're drawing, if we're not writing out it just, just as NO2, we want to show the formal charge on each of these. Because we're, if you have a nitro group, you're always going to have an oxygen that's got only one bond and a nitrogen with four bonds. So you wind up with it overall being neutral, but you have a formal charge on the oxygen and a formal charge on the nitrogen. And then this has a resonance structure as well where it goes back, where it alternates where that negative charge is. Um, although it's frequently just written as NO2. All right. The last two that we're looking at, so we did bromination and chlorination, both used the Lewis acid to generate the electrophile. Sulfonation, we used fuming sulfuric acid to make SO3, and that was our nucleophile. Nitration, we used concentrated H2SO4 to make that nitronium right here. Our last two types of electrophilic substitution are fairly similar. Um, they're what, what are known as the Friedel Crafts reaction. Um, Friedel Crafts alkylation and Friedel Crafts acylation um, work pretty similarly. We're just going to wind up using a carbon as our electrophile instead of uh, anything else. So, this is a way to add an alkyl group. Um, or an acyl group. An acyl group would be a, a carbonyl. 
if we wanted to add a carbonyl in the benzylic position, we could use this acylation. If we just wanted an alkyl group, we would use Friedel-Crafts alkylation. Um, but the mechanism is going to be pretty similar each, each time, is you've got a chloride in both cases. It's either an acid chloride or just an alkyl chloride. And you put it with a Lewis acid. And that makes this very similar structure to what we saw with the chlorination. Um, and the end result of that is we get these really strong electrophiles. Either a carbocation or what's called an acylium ion. In both cases, you wind up with a carbon that's missing a pair of electrons. And that carbon that's missing a pair of electrons is going to go find electrons. It's going to go make a sigma complex and then wind up kicking a hydrogen off again. All right, so in both of these cases, again, same mechanism. This is the only tricky part for both of these is generating the electrophile. And that's a typo in the slide. That should say two more strong electrophiles. can be generated um, using this process. And again, it's just a Lewis acid that's going to take electron density away from the chlorides and then makes the chlorine a very good leaving group and gives you a stable carbocation that can then go act as an electrophile or this acylium ion. Um, the alkylation is not all that ideal because if we're making a carbocation we can wind up with with rearrangements happening carbocation rearrangements which means we get a mixture of different products a lot of the time um, it also only works with sp3 carbons so if you have a chlorine attached to an alkene group nothing happens when we do this Um, and same if you have chlorobenzene won't react with another benzene to, to make two benzenes attached to each other. Right, so this only works with sp3 carbons, gives a mixture of products, and the yield, even when we don't have a mixture of products, the yield is not all that great. So it's a less ideal reaction. And so we actually wind up with friedel crafts alkylation winds up getting used a lot less than the acylation. Friedel Crafts acylation, you wind up with a much, um, you, you're starting from a much less stable molecule. This acid chloride molecule is a lot less stable than an alkyl chloride. And so we're going to get much better yields here. Um, and again, it's that initial step up the top is generating the electrophile. This is our electrophile right here. And then the rest of this looks just like the reactions we've been going over today. All right. I'm going to let you guys go a little early today um, for a lecture anyway, because we actually have to start lab with a little mini lecture as well. So come to lab at one like normal, and we're going to start talking about how we can build, um, build molecules in 3D on a computer. Right. So check out the lab. Um, there's a couple of programs you might try downloading and installing before lab so that you can be following along. Um, the, the lab write-up has a list of those. The main one that you want to be, um, that you want to make sure you have is a, is a, um, program called, um, uh, MacMol PLT, um, which is, it's actually designed for Macs, 
for once and happens to have Windows capability. So those of you on Macs, you should be in good shape with that. And again, it's got, this might be the Windows version has a WX in front of it. But if you just Google Mac Mole PLT, um, you'll get, um, and then you can pick which version you want to download um, for Windows or for, for Macs. Um, and then that's the program that we're going to use to build these 3D molecules. And we're going to practice importing some of them from MoleView as well. All right. So show up at one mini lecture, and then you guys are going to practice building molecules. <laughs>